Okay, fantastic. Right, I see we've got some participants lined up. Um, okay, fantastic. So we're adding some people, Stephen. Right, right. On this uh, a very strange day. <laughs> So we'll just wait for um, for a minute for people to log on. Uh, just for the attendees who have uh, logged on just now, um, I'll explain this in a second when we uh, start uh, the actual seminar. Um, but this session uh, is led by me, uh, Sebastian. Uh, it's, I'm the director of CTTR. Um, I'm going to talk to uh, Stephen and uh, the university uh, kind of uh, guidelines say that it's just a conversation between me and Stephen. And if we have questions, you can put those in the chat box. So I'll uh, explain that in a second once we have uh, some more people. And in the meantime, I may just take uh, a brief moment to talk about other uh, events that we have in the CTTR research seminar series. Uh, so today is our first session with uh, Stephen Gregg. Um, next week, we've got Professor David James from the University of Birmingham, um, who is uh, going to talk about sentimental activism, but it's basically a talk about um, the COVID situation and how doctors and nurses uh, have been writing books about caring for people. Uh, and David is going to take a close look at some of those uh, works. So that's, that's one that's lined up uh, for next week. Uh, then we've got a series of um, Being Human Festival events uh, by Rob Francis, uh, by Judith Hamilton and Daisy Black. And towards the end of this semester, uh, we've got a number of talks on, on CAST uh, by, for instance, Dr. Dag Erik Berg from Molde College, Norway. Uh, and our own um, MSc Marie Curie uh, Research Fellow at Wolverhampton, uh, Kartik Ram Monoram, who's going to talk about uh, cast, I believe, that title has not been confirmed. Okay, um, I'm going to make a start. We've got um, about eight, uh, nine attendees. Uh, if people log on, uh, we will, will, I will, will admit them. So thank you very much for, for attending this first CTTR um, research seminar series. Um, I'm going to just explain who I am and what CTTR stands for. So uh, my name is Professor Sebastian Groes. I am the director of uh, the Center for Transnational Transcultural Study uh, Research at the University of Wolverhampton. Um, 
this research center um, supports the research of the colleagues in, in mainly humanities, but also some colleagues in, in, um, in media studies. Uh, and we're supporting cutting edge research within the humanities and um, supporting public engagement events, so impact events. Uh, we are very much and um, very keen to go beyond the interdisciplinary boundaries um, and also beyond institutional boundaries. So we've got many different projects um, up, and, uh, up and running and you can find out more on our website. Uh, we've got four, four research groups that support our, our REF uh, contributions for area studies and English language and literature. We have about 23, 24 colleagues um, that are affiliated with CTTR, um, including subjects, um, uh, religious studies, uh, that, where Stephen uh, comes under, uh, philosophy, creative writing, English literature, and also language. Uh, we've got a growing body of PhD students. We've got about 30 students, but we are receiving more applications. So that's really uh, important. Uh, kind of field for us as well to involve our research students. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Stephen, uh, who, whose uh, achievements we're celebrating today. Uh, Stephen works, as I said, in uh, relig religious studies, and he is astoundingly prolific. Um, since he arrived at Wolverhampton, um, he has published four books. It's, it's really uh, an astounding achievement, which we wanted to celebrate earlier this year, uh, but it didn't work, and then COVID happened. So we're, we're very happy to, to be able to do uh, this today and celebrate um, Stephen's, Stephen's incredible work. So um, he is a senior lecturer in religious studies, and he's also uh, very interestingly the uh, um, president-elect um, of the British Society for Religious Studies. So uh, America doesn't have a, a president, but we do. So that's really great, great to know. Um, some of his books include uh, Engaging with a Living Religion, The Insider and Outsider Debate, and the Bloomsbury Handbook uh, for the Study of uh, Christians. Um, it's really incredible that, that Stephen is, is able to kind of put out so many different um, uh, books and, and the project, the wider project that he works on is really important. He's kind of aiming to, to study new forms of, of studying religion. Um, and what's key to this is religious identity. So how do we uh, give form shape to a religious identity in the 21st century? And what, what's key here is that he's looking for a new subtle way of engaging with religious practice and identity and that goes beyond the textbook ideas of, of what religious identity and, and practice should, should be like. Um, so he is looking for an embodied performance, a kind of lived uh, reality in terms of understanding what religion uh, is about. So it's not in terms of an abstract or theoretical way of engaging with religion, but as a lived kind of experience. Um, today, Stephen is going to uh, talk about uh, his, his ongoing project. Um, and the, the title of um, his uh, presentation today is a relational religious identity, orthodoxy and multi-praxic religion. Uh, and Stephen is, is going to explain a bit more about this wider project and then focus on, on the idea of that kind of lived embodied kind of religious identity and practice. So I'm gonna hand over to Stephen. Stephen, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bas. Um, and before I start, if I can just say thank you to CTTR and the School of Humanities um, for giving me a mini sabbatical allowance uh, in the last academic year that made this research uh, possible. Um, before I go into the main topic of this afternoon, which is my ongoing work with Skanda Vale, I think it's important to share with colleagues my approach to the study of religion. I think this is important as we're an interdisciplinary bunch and the study of religion comes with a very particular set of problems. The primary problem is that everyone already has an opinion on religion and an understanding or definition of religion. This often leads to fascinating lecture room discussions, but is methodologically problematical. As I always say to my first year students, not every person on the street or indeed within the academy has an opinion on marine biology or accountancy methodology, 
but every bugger has an opinion on religion. What this means is that even well-informed and well-meaning interdisciplinary scholarship, people will use the term religion but mean radically different things. So my approach is framed within a lived religion methodology. This approach makes several departures from the inherited frameworks of religious studies, which I argue are still enrobed in the theological trappings of previous generations of scholarship. Previously, academic approaches to religion sat within the world religions paradigm. This preference textual scholarship, historical and philosophical approaches to religions, and invariably gave voice to institutions, hierarchies and leaderships. It often focused on beliefs and conceptions of God, hangovers from liberal theology. Predictably, this led to essentialized understandings of religion, which allowed religious communities and worldviews to be neatly packaged. Linked inextricably with the colonial process, the world religions paradigm gave rise to the isms of scholarship, the Hinduisms, Islams, Judaisms, Sikhisms of so many textbooks. Over the course of the last 200 years, these isms have been invariably dominated by several themes, including the dominance of male voices, scriptures, leadership figures, and crucially, abstracted beliefs, which led to essentialized versions of Christianity, Hinduism, Islam, or whatever group we may care to mention. The lived religion paradigm is different. It preferences people, not texts, practices, not beliefs, and looks at everyday religious acts of everyday people, rather than essentialized frameworks which tell us what all Muslims should believe or how all Christians should act. Instead of studying religions from the top down, it studies them from the bottom up. In short, we're trying to correct the error of the first missionary and interfaith practitioners who traveled the world with a Western Christian view of religion, asking other communities, what do you believe? Whilst trying to cram diverse human understandings of religion into their theological shaped box, which focused on texts and conceptions of orthodoxy. How much better our inheritance of religious studies would have been had they asked the question, what do you do? Because when we look at what people do, we encounter lived religion everyday acts that give meanings to the lives of everyday people. And when we observe such acts, the thing we notice is that religious identity is not neat and tidy, but messy and complicated. That lay people invariably disagree with religious leaders. The groups of Buddhists, Christians or Muslims in one part of the world so often bear almost no relation to their counterparts in other parts of the world. We see that religion as lived is a dynamic and evolving phenomenon where change is normal. So when I speak of religion, I always mean this lived and dynamic definition, as opposed to the static theological definitions of the past. In the hope that it helps, here is my own definition of religion. Far from perfect, I'm sure, but honed over 25 years of thought. Religion is the intergenerational renegotiation of etiquette for everyday living between human and other than human persons. Now, colleagues from religious studies will see my dependence on the work of Graham Harvey here, which I happily acknowledge, but I introduce what I hope is a key addition to Harvey's definition, the intergenerational renegotiation, as this helps us to focus upon religion as a dynamic relational phenomenon that is radically diverse in different centuries, locations, and cultures. This understanding of lived religion is particularly relevant to my current research and the topic of this seminar, as it builds upon my previous work with Lynn Schofield and George Crusadus in particular, but also my work on Hindu identity with Vivekananda. In particular, the issue of multi-faith identity comes to the fore, and this brings into focus again conversations upon categories such as Hindu or Christian in the private practice and public projection of religious communities with whom we research. Scholars love to put people in boxes. It makes them neat, constrained and understandable. I want to argue today that we need more nuance than this to understand the lived reality of religious communities and actors. And my case study is Skander Vale. Skander Vale, or more properly, the community of the many names of God, 
is a monastic community of around 25 monks, nuns and lay people, situated in Llampimsan, Carmarthenshire, in rural West Wales. It is a large site, taking in the land and buildings of three original farms, and operates three temples, two charity shops, one on site and one in a nearby town, a simple hostel for pilgrims, and a fully equipped end-of-life care hospice in a nearby village. They also pass on over 100 tonnes of food gifts from pilgrims to aid agencies each year. They attract around 90,000 pilgrims a year from around the world, although the overwhelming majority are British pilgrims of South Asian descent, around 90% of which are Sri Lankan heritage and around 10% of which are Gujarati heritage. The monks, nuns and lay people are overwhelmingly white British or white European, with only two members of South Asian heritage. Skandavale was founded by Guru Sri Subramanian, born Percival de Silva in 1929, into a very privileged Sri Lankan family, with personal links to the Prime Minister of Sri Lanka through his mother's side. Many hagiographies, or what our friend and colleague Steve Jacobs has referred to as guruographies, include tales of prodigious childhoods, and Subramanian is no different. The product of a compassionate Hindu mother and an austere Christian father, Childhood tales of Percy include his performance of full-scale pujas or ceremonies before the age of nine and claims to have played in the wood nearby woods with his best friend, the incarnate spirit of St Francis of Assisi. De Silva left Sri Lanka at the age of 18 and travelled through Europe, setting in London two years later. During his time in London, he worked as a children's entertainer, a pot washer and a flower seller. It was while selling flowers that he gathered together a group of spiritually inquisitive Westerners who had come to his home for meditation and philosophy classes. This group included a local Methodist minister, continuing the relationship between Hindu and Christian worldviews in the Guru's philosophy. The 1970s saw a huge change in Subramaniam's life. In a vision, he saw a field that he believed was a message to build an ashram upon the site. Actively scouring newspapers and auction listings, he found the sales particular of a small farm in Carmarthenshire, visited and confirmed it was the site. After purchase, which was arranged via the sale of his lease on his London flat and further contributions from devotees, the embryonic Scandervale was born. With one dilapidated farmhouse, with no running water, no intact roof, no electricity and no phone line, and which housed itinerant sheep upon their arrival, the Guru and his initial band of devotees set about building the community brick by brick with their own labour and skills. Indeed, it's only in the last few years that any work undertaken at Scandervale has used outside contractors. For the first 40 years, all of the temples and infrastructure that you see in the pictures were built solely by community members in appallingly harsh living and working conditions. Over the years, two more neighbouring farms and a forested piece of mountainside were purchased through gifts from devotees, leading to the site we have today. The Guru died in 2007, having instituted a Swami's council prior to his death to run the day-to-day -day activities of the ashram. Scandervale is really a nickname for the community, based upon the name of Shiva's firstborn son, also called Subramanya. The formal name of the community is the community of the many names of God, and that nomenclature is very important, as the self-identity is one that rejects the label Hindu. Both in archival sermons and in recent conversations, members consistently reject the term Hindu to describe their religion. This may seem strange at first, as there are three demonstrably Hindu temples on site, dedicated to Murugan, a form of Subramanian, Ranganatha, a form of Vishnu, and Kali, a form of Shakti or feminine divine power. At these temples, puja or Hindu worship is undertaken with a mixture of English and Sanskrit, often in the form of mantras or bhajans, holy songs. Members believe in reincarnation, openly talking about past lives, not just of themselves, but of their pets, and a Hindu calendar of religious festivals is closely followed around 95% of their pilgrims are British Hindus. And yet the self-identity of Scandervale 
is of a multi-faith community. They wear Christian robes and take Franciscan vows of monasticism. They celebrate Christmas and Easter and St Francis's feast day and every Sunday there is a Christian service including the Eucharist. Mantras are sung to the Buddha and Jesus and there are depictions of Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Zoroastrian and Sikh iconography in the two larger temples. In the smaller mother of God, uh, mother, um, sorry, in the smaller mother goddess temple dedicated to Kali, there is a statue of Mary, mother of Jesus. The overwhelming majority of community members grew up in Christian or Jewish families, and for two of the Swamis in particular, their relationship with Jesus is of particular importance to their understanding of the divine, even when conducting what ostensibly appear to be traditional Hindu ceremonies. These beliefs and links to the divine are articulated in two particular ways at Skanda Vale. Again, both linked to traditional Hindu worldviews. The first of these is Bhakti Yoga and the second is Karma Yoga. Bhakti, which is often translated inadequately as devotion, really means more than that. It comes from the Sanskrit root Baj and means to be mixed up in. It's the same root word as the more familiar word we use with onion bhaji in our beloved takeaways. I think that helps to convey a meaning greater than devotion, an understanding of the divine, which means that through worship and particularly attendance at temple pujas, one can literally become mixed up in or a part of the divine through loving devotion. Karma comes from the Sanskrit word kri and means action, although it's often translated as work. In its simplest understanding, karma yoga is believed to be a route to enlightenment through selfless service. At Skanda Vale, that comes in the form of seva, which can be understood as charitable action. Here, one of Skanda Vale's unique features is highlighted, which is their focus of karma yoga upon not just humanity, but also the animal kingdom. Skanda Vale is a veritable menagerie of life. Having hundreds of acres of farmland, they have become a haven for animal life due to their simple, but absolute conviction that animal life is as sacred as human life. This has meant that over the years, they have acquired many animals that would have otherwise been slaughtered by local farmers, have rescued many birds from local markets that were destined for the table, and have an entire herd of deer which bred from a couple of animals that found their way onto the ashram from local fields. In addition to the deer, they have hundreds of geese, chickens, ducks, cows, donkeys, water buffaloes, dogs and cats. Most famously, they have two elephants, Vali and Lakshmi. Vali was a gift from the Sri Lankan government after she was orphaned as a baby and has lived at Skanda Vale for almost 40 years, fulfilling official duties as a temple elephant and giving blessings in her younger days. Lakshmi is a recent arrival, fostered from a French circus and has complex health needs. She's gone to Skanda Vale to ensure a comfortable and peaceful end of her life. Perhaps the most noteworthy and newsworthy animal to live and die at Skanda Vale was, however, Shambo, a temple bull that was the heart of a controversy in 2007 that made front page news around the world. The Shambo controversy is a complex and long story, so I'll only outline it here. It is important, though, as it directly relates to the projected identity of the community. In short, however, one of the cattle cared for at Skanda Vale tested positive for bovine tuberculosis in 2007. Under Welsh government rules, the animal had to be destroyed so as not to contaminate others, including potentially contaminating others on nearby farms. Skanda Vale were, rather obviously, appalled as this countered their view of the sanctity of all life and then argued to the authorities that Shambo was a temple animal, not part of the food chain, and that he had no contact at all with commercial livestock. Whilst these arguments received some sympathy, the legal position was clear. The law allowed for no exceptions at all. Consequently, the authorities announced that Shambo had to be given up. What happened next was little short of extraordinary. Pilgrims flocked to Skanda Vale, not just from the UK, but from around the world. 
hundreds of people formed a human shield around the temple where Shambo had been moved to in direct defiance of the government orders. In the end, the authorities carried out their removal and destruction of Shambo, with rather sheepish looking police officers picking up and carrying away many members of the community who remained peaceful in their protests to the end. The event was seismic in the history of Scandal Vale. Although it was 13 years ago, the emotions are still very raw. In conversations earlier this year, Swami still got visibly emotional when reflecting on the story. The event also had a wider effect on British religious life. For one of very few occasions, a religious minority had dominated headlines and had been largely sided with by the British public. Three years before religion would become a protected characteristic under the 2010 Equalities Act, Scandervale found itself at the heart of the battle between secular laws and minority religious worldviews. So to turn to scholarship on Scandal Vale, there's precious little to date. Jeeves and Warrior have written the only substantial articles and Knott and Parsons have mentioned the community in wider chapters on Hinduism in Britain. Indeed, so scarce is scholarship on Scandal Vale that articles from anthropologists and animal behaviorists on the elephants far outnumber articles looking at the religious life of the community. But in the scholarship we do have, Academics have invariably labelled the community as Hindu, in direct opposition to the self-identity of the community at Skanda Vale. In Jeeves' work, he explores how the religious rites and ceremonies at Skanda Vale fall outside orthodox, that's always in inverted commas, forms of Hinduism and Shaivism in particular. He is, of course, absolutely correct that they are considered unorthodox by many Hindus who cannot accept a non-Brahmin, Western white priest conducting the ceremonies. And yet, as Jeeves further notes, tens of thousands of British Hindu pilgrims a year either turn a blind eye or are genuinely unbothered by the background of the person conducting the ceremony. For them, the opportunity of darshan or a view of divinity within the temple is all that matters. In Warrior's work, an article on the Shambo controversy, she clearly locates the community as having projected a Hindu identity for the duration of the crisis. Whilst many local devotees will have engaged with the protests due to their views on the sanctity of life and their relationship with the community, it was Hindus who flew in from around the world and Hindu politicians who offered sanctuary to Shambo in their countries. Indeed, when describing Shambo to the press, the Swamis always referred to him as a temple animal and he was even physically moved to the confines of the Murugan temple as a temporary sanctuary during the standoff. Warrior helpfully notes that this alignment with a Hindu identity may well be temporary and that further identities may well be molded by what she describes as non-Hindu members of the community who are now making decisions after the death of the Hindu founding guru, again her words. I'm going to return to this point in my concluding remarks. So I want to just say a little bit about my relationship with Scandal Vale and my field visit. I've known the community since 1995, when I arrived as a student at nearby Lamperton. Upon my return to the University of Wales as a lecturer in 2006, I was a frequent visitor until 2013. During this period, I regularly brought students on study visits, and took my young family to fates and open days. I mention this as the length of my relationship has proven to be an important factor in gaining access. Scholarship on Skanda Vale is limited precisely because they are so circumspect about who they allow in. Indeed, during my time with them earlier this year, I found out that they, as a matter of course, turned down all requests from academics to study the group, which is on average about 10 a year every year. I mention this not to suggest that I somehow have a privileged position, but to remind us that fieldwork is always a negotiation and getting access is often the hardest part. Indeed, so unusual was I that one devotee who had known Guru and had been visiting for over 30 years expressed huge surprise and happiness that I was there with the words, blimey, they must really trust you, so you're all right by me. Having not returned to Scandervale since leaving Wales again in 2013, 
I spent a lockdown shortened fieldwork mini sabbatical there in February and March of this year. In just a short two week period, which was supposed to be a month before COVID hit, I was able to reconnect with old faces and meet the many new faces that had arrived in my absence. During this time, I lived as a full member of the community. I rose at 4.30 a.m. each morning for puja in the Murugan temple and would go to at least three services a day, but more often four or five, with the last at 9 p.m. In between, everyone living at Skanda Vale had to do at least four hours and usually much more of seva. This is very often gendered at Skanda Vale. I was invariably asked to perform physical tasks and female devotees are often asked to polish brass, brass or arrange flowers. After 10 days of clearing brambles, I was lightheartedly referred to as Swami Bramblananda by the other devotees and would have killed for the chance to polish brass in the warmth of the temple. But that would have been to miss the point. I was being tested by the community. Having placed their trust in me, they expected me to muck in and I was happy to do so. However, an average day included four and a half hours in temple services and five hours of physical labor. With meal times also set, and some temples a 20 minute walk in each direction from other parts of the site, grabbing moments for formal conversations was a challenge. But I learned huge amounts by deep hanging out, as Clifford Geertz so wonderfully described fieldwork. Thankfully, in my second week, I had more time to talk with members one to one and the brothers and sisters arranged my work schedule to allow for this. I think that meant I'd passed the test. Access to the community was clearly controlled, especially with regard to physical space, where refectory areas and some worship spaces were separated for permanent members of the community, but all but one member of the community were opening and welcoming, and no subjects, including members leaving and minor scandals, were off topic. Indeed, as is often the case, people wanted to share their stories with someone interested in their life and worldview. At the end of my time, I had 54 pages of handwritten notes and had spent 58 hours sitting on the cold floor at temple services, in addition to a similar number of hours of physical labor. As I emerged from a life with no radio, newspapers, television, internet or phone reception, I encountered a world on the precipice of lockdown. So what did I find in my time at Scandal Vale? I looked at two main issues. How authority manifested after the death of the guru and how the multi-faith elements of life affected identity. As background to each of these, it is important to note that I found evidence for a continued belief in a Hindu cosmology. Skanda Vale has long associated with a worldview based on Advaita Vedanta, a monistic cosmology which teaches that there is only one reality and that difference is illusion. The whole point of the human condition is to realise our oneness with this reality and thus achieve liberation or moksha. Swami still revert to this position when explicating their worldview. And yet there are also clear examples of Vishishtadvaita Vedanta or qualified non-dualism. In short, this position argues that we have a common essence, a spark of divinity, if you like, with ultimate reality. This approach allows for a more devotional form of religious practice. Um, with monistic views of reality, it's, it's often asked why one should worship if you're effectively only worshiping yourself. And this is highly relevant as it's become normalized in many Hindu traditions since the work of Vivekananda that I outlined in my recent book, to understand these different approaches as a stepped view of religion, which culminates in Advaita Vedanta, a form of hierarchical inclusivism. For many Hindus, this crosses religions and will inculturate practices and figures from different traditions, but only as lower forms of spirituality when compared to the highest truths of Advaita. I outline this because there is a clear hierarchical inclusivism at Skanda Vale, but not in this traditional way. The claims of the community members to a multi-faith identity must also be critiqued to understand it fully. Each of these related issues 
can be seen to play out in issues of authority and issues of identity within the movement. The traditional view of second generation religious communities is one of institutionalized or concretized charisma, wherein a council, institution or other body takes over decision making and authority after the founder has died. I suggest that something subtly different can be seen to be happening at Scandal Vale, and that is linked to the view of the guru himself. For community members, the guru has not gone, he's just dead. In fact, he really hasn't gone. He's buried intact on a site in a special Mahad Mahasamdi shrine, not cremated like most Hindus. He is still a relatable person. He simply happens to be dead. Conversations are held with him as if he's in the room. Members who never met him talk of him as if they'd had personal meetings. Whilst the Swami Council could be seen as institutionalized charisma, their embodied theology is a continuation of relational authority with the guru as an other than human person. The trajectory that he put in place for Skandavale is not an abstract instruction, but a continuation of a relatable embodied authority. It is not the institution of a Hindu tradition or cosmology that the Swami Council is embodying, but the institution of a personality with a very unorthodox, syncretic worldview. This therefore means that Skandavale's relational religious identity, linked as it is with categories of multi-faith and Hindu, needs re-examining. Jeeves is clear to link Shaivism and Warrior is clear to link Hindu. I don't disagree with their findings per se, I just think that they're asking the question at slightly the wrong angle. Whilst agreeing with Warrior in particular, that they have used the category of Hindu when it's politically useful, despite rejecting the term again and again in conversations during fieldwork, identity and authority is not gained from this category. Indeed, there's a lovely bemusement given off by members when academics try to fit them into a box as specimens of study. What I'm suggesting is that we should not ask the question, what box do they fit in? but rather from where do they take their authority? By shifting the question, I think we get a better understanding of the lived performative understanding of their worldview. Members are not interested in the heritage of a particular school of philosophy as outlined by the mix of a very strict form of Advaita theory with a clear preference for Vashishta Advaita practice, but instead ask, what would Guru do? Orthodoxy of belief is deferred to multipraxy of action based on what I want to call autodoxy. It is the life and actions, the teachings and example of the founding guru, which gives Skandavale an identity. He was not an ordained member of a movement such as the Ramakrishna Math, with an identity contingent upon agreed teachings and hierarchies of authority. He strode out to the West independently with what sociologists of religion have referred to as a bricolage approach, sometimes denigrated with the term pick and mix spirituality, although for the record, that's what all religious people do. In so doing, he becomes the focal point of authority. His story is their story and orthodoxy replaces orthodoxy. This has a direct knock-on to Scandavale's form of hierarchical inclusivism and relationship to conceptions of Hinduness. Skandavale's hierarchical inclusivism is quite different to Vivekananda's. Whereas Vivekananda totally reinterpreted his own guru, changing him from an ecstatic bhakti devotee to a sage Advaita philosopher, and whereas Vivekananda had a hierarchical inclusivist framework that was clearly Advaitic, Skandavale has a hierarchical inclusive framework that is autodoxical. This means there is fuzziness between their Advaita and Vashishta Advaita practices and worldviews. But that simply doesn't matter to the members of Skandavale. Perhaps in an example of Festinger's cognitive dissonance, this seeming contradiction is perfectly acceptable as it is following the Guru's example. It does not need to revert to a wider cultural framework. For the members of Skandavale, 
even for those that did not meet him during his life. Their Guruji provided a direct experiential link to the divine. So his example is all that is needed. So although Warrior and Jeeves are correct, the Skandavale position themselves within a Hindu worldview when it is expedient so to do. That is different to defining the movement as Hindu per se. Back in the 1980s, our esteemed colleague Eileen Barker, now Professor Emeritus at LSE, produced her great work, The Making of a Muni. Based on close ethnographic work with converts to the Unification Church, Barker simplified the questions we ask of religious communities in the face of a barrage of criticism from the anti-cultic movement against anyone who studied minority or new religions. Barker's great contribution was not to walk into the community with a framework into which to fit the group, but to walk in and observe what people actually did. This simple subversive act brought the theory of Malinowski into practice. In the same way, I argue that we must define religion as we find it, not how we expect to find it. The community at Skanda Vale may well fit some aspects of a Hindu framework of religion and may well use the term when it suits them. But a better understanding of their identity is one which sits within the eclectic bricolage personality of their founding guru. It is through following an orthodoxy based on his life and teachings that they embody and perform not a multi-faith or Hindu form of religion, but a multi-praxic form of religion, relational with, but not limited to, Hindu worldviews. Great, thank you, Stephen. That was really, really remarkable. Um, thank you very much for that illuminating talk. Um, it was extremely rich in, in terms of its, uh, uh, its, its ideas, and it, it's really original in terms of what you're trying to uh, achieve and also the idea of embedding yourself in the Scandavel group, um, which is, I guess, very unusual. So, so well, well done on that. And um, I've got a couple of questions, and I hope that some of our colleagues uh, will be able to uh, uh, put some questions to you as well. But I've got some maybe naive questions, and I'm just wondering. Um, um, yeah, to, to start with, about the Skanda Vale as, a, as a, a, a particular kind of group, how does money work and, and how do, does the education of children work? So just very, um, very practical questions. Um, how, how, is there a circulation of money? How, how do they generate money, etc.? Sure. Sure. Um, money is really complex at Skanda Vale. Mm -hmm. um, the monks and nuns take Franciscan vows of poverty, chastity and obedience, mm -hmm. uh, and they take the poverty part really seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so they try not to handle money, uh, physically handle money, sure. uh, which ironically is actually part of a Hindu tradition. Ramakrishna used to sort of, you know, uh, run away from money if someone sort of put it near him. Um, but um, they are a not for profit charitable organization. Mm -hmm. um, they have lots of money actually, um, because pilgrims and devotees are very generous. Um, so it's spent on the fabric uh, of Skanda Vale, the temples, uh, the puja, but also large amounts of money are donated each year to international food uh, programs. Um, but they, uh, the monks and nuns themselves take their vow of poverty so seriously um, that um, on one occasion, I tried to give one of the, years ago this was, I tried to give one of the monks uh, a fiver because uh, he was doing a charity fun run and he actually recorded from it and I realized mm. what I'd done and, and he sort of said oh it's fine and, and took the money because it wasn't his money he, you know was giving it to the hospice um, but uh, you're not allowed money in the temples for example sure, sure, um, sure. so it's taken very seriously but they're not short of money pilgrims are incredibly uh, um, generous uh, but they're then given out to aid programs great great thank you and just another practical question how does it work with uh, education of children for instance are they uh, educated inside scandal vale or how, how does that work yeah the, the children aren't really a, an issue at present in mm. scandal vale for the permanent community um in years past they have had school aged children living there um they have lay members um at present there's a married husband and wife team uh, that do the website um and lead on some of the music worship uh they live at scandal 
the Vale. Um, and in the past, there have been families live there as lay members uh, with school aged children. But, but I'm going back sort of 25 years there. Sure, sure. Um, but they do have an awful lot of education visits every year. Um, so they're, they're keen to sort of share their worldview as many churches and mosques do as well. Um, but there are no children there at present. OK, thank you. Um, interesting. Um, your concept of orthodoxy, uh, I, I find that quite interesting, but um, I want to press you a little bit more on that before we start answering some of the questions that, that our colleagues have put in the box. So um, th this is really about the life and actions of someone, but could you could you go into detail? What, what does that exactly mean? So uh, the authority that comes out of a life spirit, a, a way of living, but also the actions of someone. That still sounds a bit vague. So can you give us a, some detailed kind of uh, practical examples of how that works? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm still wrestling with this, to be honest. I mm -hmm. mean, I, I sort of came up with the term just a few months ago and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with it really and sort of right. taking okay. the edges of this. Um, but it's, if you reduce it to a common denominator, you could look at a cult of personality. That's not what I'm suggesting. It's mm -hmm. something more than that. And it's about how an inherited way of understanding the world, an inherited worldview is embodied by the next generation. I think what I'm particularly interested in is the people that didn't even meet the guru. Right. They talk yeah, as sure. if they knew him. Sure. Because it's this trajectory that he had, this sort of uh, spiritual karmic understanding of their relationship with God, their path and their mission for Scandal Vale, which was embodied by Guru for the, for the members. Mm -hmm. um, and what's important in that and the direction they go in isn't linked to one philosophical or religious tradition. Sure. It's only linked to Guru's particular identity. I mean, mm -hmm. there are mantras to the Buddha, there's Sikh iconography, but they're not really major parts of the life of the community. It's mm. Hindu and Christian facets, and it's no coincidence that that's because that's the guru's background. Yes. So it's where the focus is on the individual rather than a wider tradition. Precisely. So yeah. I, you know, I need to play with this more, but that's that's really what I mean. There. I'm just I'm wondering how you will define this. Uh, is there a set of rules that define this person and and their actions or something, and just becomes a some kind of code or something I'm, I'm just wondering so anyway but yeah yeah, yeah. well i need to think <laughs> on that more but, Precisely, but it yeah. probably wouldn't be a code i mean one of the things that i i never met the guru um because mm -hmm. um when i was spending a lot of time at scandal vale, he was very ill in the hospice um and he died in 2007 um but you know talking to people that spent time with him uh, he was eclectic he changed his mind in the middle of the conversation he tells you to do one thing one day one thing another Perfect. and they sort of shared stories of this with me as really happy anecdotes because that they knew they had authority that it didn't matter if it was the opposite of last week if guru said to do it they knew it was right you know so it's that focus on the individual relationship and yeah, teachers yeah, yeah. interesting um okay so uh, i've got some more questions but we can um answer that after two o'clock because i know that some people may need to leave uh, the meeting so let's go to the chat box the q a box and and i think rob francis he's got uh, a question for you um <laughs> The, the onion body. I love the idea of being tangled. It's a cheap gag. It's <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, if religious practice is an act of finding your place in the world or purpose in the chaos, and this is the form of enlightenment, an, uh, an ecological one, or um, of being aware of the interconnectedness and uh, deliberately engaging in the necessary fight against the natural realms. Uh, there is an ecological, thank you, Rob. Uh, there is an ecological awareness uh, at Scandal Vale. Obviously, part of that is the human animal interaction. Part of that is the vegetarianism, mm, uh, yeah. not veganism, interestingly, um, because ghee and yogurts are used in the pujas as they are in, in most uh, Hindu worship. Um, and they have, for example, a, a windmill with um, a wind power. Uh, they are self-sufficient when it comes to heating from wood from their own land. They have made efforts. Um, that's, that's a conversation with Steve Jacobs, really, isn't it? Because he's looking at ecology and, and sort of utopian worldviews and religion. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there is an element of ecology there, but it's really manifested most in the relationship between the interrelatedness between humans and animals. Thank you. Um, I know that some people will be able to stay after two o'clock, so I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you to answer Nicholas' question, uh, which is about uh, the uh, COVID crisis and how that has affected the community. 
Uh, yeah, it's changed the, thank you, Nicola. Um, it's changed the community a lot, actually. Obviously, they were in lockdown like everyone. And of course, being in Wales, they've been locked down for the last two weeks as well. Mm. They did reopen for a few weeks in between, which really surprised me. Mm. Um, they were doing it on almost ticketed entry. I mean, obviously not charge tickets or anything like that, but you needed to book a slot and have a, yeah, a ticketed uh -huh. entry. Um, and no one could stay overnight. It was only day visits, which is very difficult for people traveling from Leicester or Bradford or London. Um, but uh, what I've noticed is that in the last three months, they've reverted like many communities of course to online communication that's stating the obvious but in doing this what they've done is they've put a much greater focus on the guru um, they're now putting his old sermons and lectures up online uh, they yeah, I'm a member of their whatsapp group now and they send out inspirational quotes every day uh, from the guru and lots of pictures and and so yes they're increasing online activity because of covid but it interests me that the focus of that is almost exclusively on the guru himself so that might well back up what i'm saying about this this notion of orthodoxy it's really an inter interesting tension between this individual and the multipraxic form and this kind of more heterotopian approach almost to to religion and yeah but i mean he, he was multipraxic i suppose mm -hmm. that that's the point isn't it and it, and it's where i mean we can argue about are they christian on a sunday are they you know, mm -hmm. days, you know? It, it's not about the tradition it comes from it's about yeah. looking at what they actually do as it were so you know mm. they hold a, a eucharist and that's a christian form of worship mm. um but mm. you know so that's where we get that i'm not arguing they are from a christian tradition so sure, hey, hence sure. the, the focus on the practice i suppose it's it's, it's fascinating and particularly in this, this time of uh yeah, polarization. This this offers really a model for maybe, uh, yeah, alleviating or, or thinking about the, the, that kind of type of concern. Um, okay, we got a question from uh, Arlet Thomas. Uh, um, interested in what you were saying about Scandervale as an example of pick and mix religion. In my own research, I've found pick and mix brick and large to be uh, indices of global process of digitization, globalization, etc. cetera. Um, but Scandervale seems on the other end of the scale, close knit and insular. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us more about the sources Scandervale draws this multi faith uh, dy dynam dynamic form, um, and how does it communicate? Yeah, so, okay. so more, there's, more, there's more detail. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for the, the question, Alid. Um, I, I think I, I actually I want to pick up on one bit at the beginning of that, actually, where you're talking about sort of indices of global mm. uh, processes. Um, that's, that's not necessarily wrong, but I'd be careful there because, I mean, you know, you can go back in, in periods of history and I'm thinking of sort of, you know, Bengal in the 19th century, you know, and, and the bricolage between everyday Muslims and Hindus there was so great that actually you wouldn't be able to identify who was in which camp, you know, in some villages, you know, in Bengal. Gaul 100 years ago. Um, so this, this sort of pick and mix act, uh, activity of bricolage, I think has always been there uh, in religions when they're in uh, fusion uh, and syncretism. Um, but the question about where they draw their sources from, um, it's, it's overwhelmingly from Guru's life an example. The fact that he had uh, a Hindu mother, uh, a Christian father, the fact that he had Christian friends while he was in London. Um, it's also slightly more eclectic than that. Um, so it's grown over the years. One of the things that's really interesting to me um, is the development of the Christian service, which they hold on a Sunday night and they celebrate Easter and Christmas uh, as well. And I've actually managed to get the archival documents for the old orders of service for every Christmas service they've had for about the last 25, 30 years. And you can see the subtle shifts and changes and they're dependent on the members of the community at the time. So it's almost as if the guru set the ball in motion, but then it's gone along the avenues he pointed them down uh, um, a, according to the sort of the likes and dislikes of the members. Um, I mentioned two Swamis in particular who are quite big on the sort of Christian uh, praxis, um, but one's Catholic and one's Protestant and right. he's German Protestant. So, you know, they're, they're quite sort of opposite extremes. And you can see those influences in their contributions to the liturgy uh, and the service, which gets rewritten on a fairly regular basis. Interesting, interesting. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Mina's question. She she asks she's asking if there's room for questioning authority. And can I just add to that? So you were talking about this gender division of labour, hmm. which which to me doesn't really fit into some of the current emancipatory 
debates that we're having. So just wondering, are people rebelling against that? And, and are there more kind of uh, yeah. questioning of authority? There's a fantastic conversation going on at Scandal at the moment about gender. Um, it's, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a couple of the young sisters, um, one of whom didn't know the guru, um, she only joined the community um, after he died, but one of whom did. Um, they are really pushing for more integration. Mm. Um, so, for example, the sisters now join a weekly meeting that used to be just the brothers. Um, there's a much more equal conversation going on between the members of the community. Mm. And when I was doing the physical labor of sort of mucking out the animals or clearing the brambles and stuff, I was doing that with sisters uh, right. as well as with brothers. Um, but there is still this tendency to revert to uh, mm. a, a gendered uh, step stereotypes for work patterns. Um, mm. It tends to be the sisters that work in the hospice rather than the brothers, and it's a swami that runs it. So right. you've got that gendered <laughs> hierarchy there. Uh, but there are no female swamis, of course, um, right. and there aren't going to be in any time soon. Right, right, that right, that right, is not right. changing, I'm sure. Um, so you can push at the authority. It's happening with the gendered question at the moment. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And a meanest question about uh, in more general terms. Do, do people question, challenge authority? How is authority rolled out in the first place? Well, how, do, how does that work? Yeah, it, well, since the Guru's death, it works in something called the Swami Council, mm -hmm. uh, which is six of the senior Swamis um, uh, have a weekly meeting um, and basically make all the decisions for the life of the community. Um, the brothers and sisters can put questions and topics for conversation and ask for things at the council, um, but it is the council that makes that decision. Mm -hmm. And actually part of your monastic vows are to not question authority. Mm -hmm. in, in fact, um, one of the brothers who's an, an old school teacher actually, um, used to always tell me when I took students to visit him because he, he always did the educational visits. He said, we take three vows. We take poverty, that's okay, that's fine. We take chastity, uh, you get used <laughs> to it. We take poverty. Uh, sorry, we take obedience. And he mm. always said the most difficult one was obedience. Yeah, so yeah. actually, it's supposed to be hard. It's supposed to perhaps be tough. Um, and they would argue that's mm. part of submission to God's will, it's part of submission uh, to something bigger than ourselves. And, and are you aware that this sometimes leads to clashes at all? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so can, oh, yes, yeah, can absolutely. You, can you give us an example of, of a situation? Well, I, I mean, like any religious movement, people join and people go. Mm. Um, and yeah, there, there was a large falling out just a couple of years ago, actually, uh, with one of the uh, Swamis that actually I'd spent a lot of time with over the years and had received most of my groups of students when I'd taken them there. Right. Um, and it, it's hurt the community a lot. It, it's still quite raw. Uh, he was the senior Swami, really. Um, right, right, right. And he's uh, he left just two years ago. So absolutely, con conflicts happen. Everyone's human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Joseph has a question. Um, how does their contribution of other faiths and philosophies affect their standing within the eyes of external, perhaps more orthodox traditions? Yeah, Scandervale are often not popular with other religious traditions. Um, mm. Jeeves has looked, Ron Jeeves, um, who I used to work with up in Liverpool, he's now a professor down at Cardiff. Um, he um, He's looked specifically at uh, Shaivism in the diaspora, and he's looked at sort of orthodox, and I, I don't like using that word, but orthodox uh, Hindu views of Scandervale. Um, it's also, of course, a conversation for Christians. Uh, I mean, if I, I'm saying they hold a Christian service on a Sunday, they hold a Eucharist, well, a Roman Catholic would say, no, they don't, because it's not an ordained priest conducting the Eucharist, yeah, therefore yeah, yeah. it's not a eucharist um so it's i don't want to say they've wound people up because that wouldn't be true but there are people that simply are dismissive mm. of the practice at scandal vale because it doesn't fit into their closely defined box as to how one should be a hindu or how one should be a christian or so on and but to go back to joseph jo joseph's question um 
are there are there links between those other groups and and scandal fail or are they really kind of insular as as another contributor was saying yeah yeah um I, I wouldn't say they're insular i mean they've just opened a uh, new temple well three years ago uh, in switzerland because the guru used to go over and give seminars there uh, okay. they've got devotees from all over mm -hmm. the world and they've now got links with two I don't want to call them gurus, but holy men uh, in India. Um, but they don't have a lot to do with the local community. Um, they don't look outside the community at all. Mm. Uh, talking to one of the Swamis um, when I first got there, um, the first 25 years he lived there, he didn't leave the site at all, well, apart from yeah. to go to the doctors. Mm. Um, so, you know, if they are insular in that sense of the term. They're, they're not interested in having conversations with other mm. religious authorities. They've already got their way of viewing the world and all the authority they need, I suppose. Interesting. And, and, how, yeah, no, and how they relate to the, the general outside world at large, more generally. So they're not in touch with other religious groups, but how, how, how do they relate to our world or the world beyond scandal well, they, they try not to really mm -hmm. i mean mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the um brothers or sisters will go shopping once a week in Carmarthen, um and you know that that's done because you know you've got to eat uh, yep. but but actually most of their food comes from gifts from pilgrims anyway mm -hmm. food is incredibly simple and actually boring um yeah, yeah, yeah. so um you know things like that are just kept simply when it comes to things like clothes um they just have whatever's given to them uh That's one of the true. brothers told me a story about wearing wellies that were two sizes too small for him for three years because that's the only pair he'd been given mm -hmm. um so it is a it's not a rejection but it's a turning away from the world they're not really interested in a conversation with the world they're interested in conversation with the divine it, it, it's as simple as that really interesting and so ola has kind of uh, given us a follow-up question <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. not about how they think about the outside yeah, world yeah. or local communities but how do local communities engage with them or think about them yeah it's a brilliant question ola thank <laughs> you so much um welsh farmers in Carmarthenshire are not known for their sort of tolerance of outsiders uh, as, as you know someone who lived there for many years um to be honest they were seen as a bit of an absurdity to begin with um back in the sort of 70s and 80s they were sort of seen as the strange hippies down the road right. um but i think there's a begrudging respect actually that's grown <laughs> recently because they give hundreds of tons of aid to save the children and, and yeah. other international aid foundations every year there's no doubt that the large numbers of pilgrims have upset some uh, local communities others mm. have set up bed and breakfasts and have whole careers is based on you know serving uh, the the community um that they really upset the community a few years ago when they built a coach park without planning permission uh, and got into a lot of trouble from Carmarthenshire county council about that um so they've been sort of flashpoints um, yeah. but it, it it has to be said that most of their uh, 95 percent of their pilgrims are from sort of leicester and bradford but the other five percent the sort of white middle class local pilgrims actually aren't that local they tend to come from the sort of little england beyond wales in pembrokeshire uh, yeah, yeah, they don't yeah. tend to come from the very close locality interesting um um yeah let's go go to a question uh, from george to what extent do you think scandal offers a model for studying religion more widely it's not typical of other religious communities that have a more clear identity uh like mainstream forms of christianity um yeah yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Thank you, George. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Um, you've asked me the tricky question. So <laughs> um, I, I think there is a model there because I think I'd actually push back a little bit, actually, because obviously George and I have, have written together and worked together on, on Christianity before. Mm. And I think this is probably where I'd push back a little bit to say that actually, even in the mainstream forms of Christianity, you're going to get a huge diversity of lived experience within that tradition it's the old cliche about two catholics kneeling at the same altar having a totally different conception of god in their heads while they're praying so i would want to push back a little bit on that but i wonder if the thing that might be useful is this orthodoxy this second generation authority and that of course builds on the work of people like eileen barker you know who says that the most interesting question you can ask in religion is what happens when your leader dies so you know i wonder if we can start 
playing with this term of auto autodoxy and that that might be helpful when we look at other traditions because the mainstream traditions were embryonic religions once as well you know as, as George knows better than I do as a specialist in NRMs. <laughs> right I mean I, I think another question to ask is whether um, Scannerfeld doesn't offer a model for studying mainstream religion but, but other kind of communities small communities that, that do what Scannerfeld do so have you have you done some comparative work on uh, comparing them to other uh, communities of this type? Uh, not not yet. I mean, I'm, right. I'm at the start, really, of this of this project, although I've known Scandervale for a very long time. Mm -hmm. uh, my sort of radar has been elsewhere for my research. Right. And it's really only now that I'm sort of coming home, as it were, to, to use them as my primary uh, case study. Um, but I would again, actually, I might push back on that just a little bit, Baz, mm -hmm. because one of the things I'm quite passionate about is not separating out minority and majority traditions. Right, you know, I right, like right. to sort of look at religion happening and people doing religion. And I think one of the things that we can fall into the trap in is asking different questions of minority religions than we do of mainstream. Mm. And the only reason we do that is because mainstream is part of our inherited cultural capital. So we privilege them. And I'm not sure we should. So yeah, yeah I'm not saying that we should, but, but, um, well, the Scandervale kind of uh, setup is it is different, obviously. Oh, so I'm just oh, wondering, sure. it, I mean, are there more examples in the UK of, of this type of community? And I'm just wondering if you can compare. Uh, yeah, there are, mm. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on that, but I mean, mm. there are other um, monastic Hindu groups. I mean, you know, obviously it's back to Vedanta Manor, the famous Hare Krishna Centre in uh, Hertfordshire. Um, there are other sort of spiritual um, agricultural organisations like Fintorn in Scotland. Um, you know, there are Anglican monastic communities just down the road from me, just, just in Shropshire. So they do exist, yes, but how closely aligned they would be, not sure. Not yeah, sure. Yeah, um, but so uh, that's, you know, that's for a second stage, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, no, that, that's really that's really great. Um, we have one question left over from Xi, but I think this this was kind of bouncing off a, a question we uh, answered earlier. So I was just wondering, um, yeah. So it's it, it's it's whether other religions were tolerant towards uh, Scandervale, I think. So yeah, I, I I think we might have covered that already. Actually, yeah, I mean, they they don't choose Scandervale. Don't choose to have communication with other traditions particularly um and you know most traditions would sort of say well that's not a proper way of being hindu or that's not a, a proper way of being christian you know please excuse excuse the sort of blanket statements mm -hmm. um so th there just tends to be no dialogue there and you know they're, they're perfectly happy with that yeah, yeah, yeah. um i'm i'm going to finish um if there are no questions anymore with uh, kind of a, a bigger maybe a reductive question but what what can we learn from Skander Vale um, as as a model for how people live their lives? Not not necessarily as as a, a multipraxic form, but just the way in which people operate, the, the way in which that community operates. What can we learn um, that would benefit our society at large? Um, gosh, what a, a huge question! Sorry, it's a huge I question. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> How long you got? Um, I, do you know, I think that there are, I mean, anything is going to be a value judgment, isn't it? And mm -hmm. the irony is we try and avoid value judgments in religious studies, but I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, I think we can learn from their ecology. I think we can learn from their communitarian living which doesn't mean everyone has to go off and become part of the hippie commune yeah, um, yeah, yeah. it does mean that we can actually understand our interrelationality and actually that doesn't even need to be with the divine or with god because religious studies is traditionally methodologically agnostic um and you can think perhaps um long time ago um first book that i ever did uh, was called jesus beyond christianity um and desmond tutu was kind enough to do mm. a forward for the book and he wrote about something called ubuntu and Ubuntu is an Nguni uh, language word, which means that I am a person because of other people. I only make sense in interrelation to other people. And if you look at the work of someone like Robert Putnam, the great Harvard sociologist, uh, who argues that we've got a fragmentation of society since the 1950s mm -hmm. to the modern day, uh, he's not a scholar of religion, but he argues religion is one of the ways in which we can knit 
people back together mm. again. And I just wonder whether that interpersonal understanding of our world, which is less binary, yeah, where we yeah, understand yeah. a relational continuum of identity, mm. I wonder if that might not be a better way of understanding our yeah. fellow humans. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, uh, I definitely can see how, how that would work in theory. Uh, in, in practice, it's a different yeah, yeah. ball game, I think. Uh, quite, Alad's quite. <laughs> As we're seeing in America. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> um, Alad, uh, let's go to another question. Now, are there any, any examples of apostates? Um, have any members publicly uh, rejected the Guru's authority in death? Um, so two subtle halves to that question. Yes, there are apostates. Yes, there are people that have left. Um, one of these very senior swamis that left just a couple of years ago. Um, and it was quite a public falling out. It was specifically about uh, authority and his role in the movement, mm -hmm. but also uh, these things always come down to the basis of humanity, don't they? It was about interrelations you know with members of the community as well um you know gendered relations um mm. so uh, yes there are examples of apostasy there aren't really examples of people publicly rejecting the guru after his death that i've come across there are a couple of websites where people have written sort of disparaging comments about scam the veil or the guru um but i don't have the evidence that they were ever sort of members or regular visitors. They could just be a keyboard warrior. I, I don't have the evidence that they were internal uh, to the organization. I have no doubt they exist. Mm. Uh, I'm planning to go back in June if, if lockdowns allow um, and to spend more time, you know, quality time with them another two or three weeks. Um, and I'm gonna try and sort of, you know, have those conversations then because to their credit, Everything was on the table. They were happy to talk about everything, including people that had left and passed through uh, the community. Right, very interesting. Okay, um, unless we have any other questions from the um, the members uh, from the panel, um, I think we can we can round off. I think and. Um, Stephen, I want to really thank you for such a, an insightful paper. I had really no idea that this was uh, <laughs> taking place around the corner from where we are, basically. Uh, um, you, you haven't lived until you've walked an elephant through the woods in Wales, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time and the presentation. It's been really a remarkable kind of first session for the CGTR seminar series. Uh, again, con congratulations on your uh, president elect uh, and status for the British Association for the Study of Religions. Uh, we wish you all the best and we hope you can go to Scam Nouvelle soon. Thank you very much. See you very soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you everyone who was here. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you.